Bible study for August 18. I am on the porch of my childhood home. My parents moved here when I was going into the fourth grade and my mother still lives here. I'm going to close out our quarter with this lesson. So I'm actually using the lesson for August 25th. I don't plan to be in the pulpit or teaching Sunday school on the 25th, but this lesson was a better one to close the quarter out with because it concludes the story of Paul at Ephesus that we began last week. But as we think about closing the quarter down, I do want to remind you of a couple of the things that we've learned over the quarter. This has been a quarter about us doing missions together. And we've learned that starting with Jesus, our faith really is the formation of a whole new family that is open to everybody. Men, women, rich, poor, slave, free, Jew, Gentile. It really doesn't matter. The, the doors are wide open in the church for everyone. And we see in the book of, of Acts how uh, the church has to wrestle with what to do with Gentiles when they come into the church, or what to do with women, what to do with, with slaves, what to do with people who once were something else and now are coming into the church as Christians. And the answer is that Jesus is uh, there for all of us, that he indeed is Lord of all. And this is pretty... Uh, dramatic stuff, uh, particularly for the first century, as we will see in a little bit. And then the second thing that we discover is that the church cares about everybody, even if they aren't in the church. The church cares for everyone. The church is not tribalistic, where it's just all about my tribe and me and mine, and, and I don't care about what happens to those on the outside. Uh, a friend of mine who's a pastor says the church is one of the only organizations in the world that exists solely for the purpose of for those outside of the organization. And I think that's a little bit stronger than we would say because it does exist for us on the inside as well. And yet we always should be outward looking. That's the missional focus. And there is nobody outside of the scope of God's forgiveness, outside of the scope of salvation. And so with that in mind, I want to show you a little bit of a clip. This comes from the Bible Project, and this is an explanation of, of Acts and the section of Acts that we are in, which is uh, today the 19th chapter where Paul is in Ephesus. And so uh, if you will, take a look at this little clip because that'll kind of set up what we're going to do for the rest of this lesson. And it's this multi-ethnic reality of the Jesus movement that leads us to the next theme Luke wants us to see in the missionary journeys, namely the clash of cultures between the early Christians and the Greek and Roman world. Luke records multiple clashes in Philippi, Athens, and Ephesus. Paul goes and announces Jesus as the revelation of the one true God and as the king of the world, who shows up all other gods and idols as powerless and futile. And his message is consistently viewed as subversive to the Roman way of life, and he gets accused of being a dangerous social revolutionary. These stories show how the multi-ethnic, monotheistic Jesus communities did not fit into any cultural boxes known to the Roman people. The ancient world had just never seen anything like them. And the Christians aroused more than just suspicion. Another theme Luke repeats is how Paul and the Christians are constantly being accused of rebellion, even treason against Caesar, the Roman emperor. People heard Paul correctly. He was announcing that there's another king, Jesus. And they also correctly saw that the Christian way of life was a challenge to many Roman cultural values. But every time Paul gets arrested and interrogated before Roman officials, they don't see any threat and he's dismissed. These stories show us the paradox that the early church presented to the world. It was a Jewish messianic movement, but it was ethnically diverse, full of communities that treated men and women and rich and poor and slave and free all as equals. And they all gave their allegiance to King Jesus alone and no other God or king. And so their very existence, it turned upside down the core values of Roman culture, but the Christians posed no military threat because Jesus taught them to be people of peace. And so the only crime Paul and the Christians can be accused of is not conforming to the status quo. So we see those themes. Jesus is Lord of all. The church is for everyone. The church reaches out and cares for everyone. And the church is the one true reality. And now, as you hear the scripture lesson for today, uh, be thinking about those themes, seeing where you, you can find them. And what I chose to do today was to use uh, the uh, movie Acts that the New International, I mean, the, excuse me, the uh, International Bible Society 
put out a number of years ago. And these, all the words you hear are right out of the New International Version uh, of, uh, of, of the book of Acts. But it, it's portrayed, and this is such a neat story. I thought it would be neat to get to see it. So here is our passage uh, from Acts, the 19th chapter. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together, along with the workmen in related trades, and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow, Paul, has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There's danger. Not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Archimedes of the Ephesians! The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither rubbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So there's a bit of an irony in this passage uh, for today because the silversmiths are terrified that if uh, Christianity keeps growing in Ephesus, they're going to lose their business. Nobody wants to buy the effigies or the, the little statues, the idols of Artemis that they are selling 
Uh, the irony is that when I was in Ephesus a few years ago, one of the things I wanted was to buy one of those because I knew that was what had started the whole riot and, and you had this whole story. And I did. I have, I have a little, it's not silver, but, but a little uh, 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 pottery uh, effigy, you might say, or whatever, idol of Artemis in my study uh, back at church that I bought in Ephesus. And so if they had realized uh, that, that actually Christians might buy them not to worship, but buy them to uh, commemorate this particular story that is in Acts, uh, maybe uh, all of these things wouldn't have happened. I don't know. Um, but with that in mind, uh, let's think a little bit. What were they afraid of, uh, these silversmiths? Well, they were afraid they would lose business. And if the church uh, impinges on business, uh, that's not funny to a lot of people, and, and they're going to get angry and even violent, as we saw there. And they also worry they're going to lose their religion. Uh, here they are in Ephesus, and they had this huge temple to Artemis in Ephesus. As a matter of fact, it was four times larger uh, than the Parthenon in, in Athens, Greece. And so this huge temple uh, to Artemis, it is a huge tourism draw. Uh, it is a huge religious draw. They have a certain amount of religious power and clout because they have this temple, and if it goes away because the Christians bring uh, Jesus in and, and, and nobody wants to worship at the temple anymore, they're going to lose that religious influence as well. Uh, and then they're just afraid then that that might cause Ephesus to lose a lot of its, its influence. It, it may even lose its political uh, influence because uh, it, it, as, as it dries up a little bit. And so they are afraid. Their fears are somewhat justified. Uh, and yet they go about trying to address those fears in the wrong way. Uh, they start that big disturbance in the streets, and then they make their way down to the, the theater. Uh, the theater in Ephesus is still there. The temple was destroyed in the mid-300s uh, by the Goths, uh, and it, it's gone. But the temple is still, I mean, excuse me, the theater is still there. Uh, when I was in Ephesus, I was there on a tour group, and uh, with a couple of ministers, uh, uh, friends of mine, uh, we said to the, to the tour guide, he said, we're going now to the, uh, the tour shop, the, the, the gift shop. And we hadn't yet been in the theater. And we said, well, can we go into the theater? And he said, well, yeah, you can, but you'll miss out on the gift shop. And we said, that's fine. We're happy to miss out on the gift shop. This theater is one of these central pieces to the, the story you know, that, that's there in uh, Acts 19. And so we went in and, and toured the, the, the ruins of the theater. And we did actually make it to the gift shop. And I got my little Artemis statue uh, nonetheless. But this theater could hold 24,000 people. Uh, and uh, that would be a big uh, amphitheater today, but it was a gigantic one uh, for that day. And the whole town, it says, ends up in that theater, and they're all yelling and screaming and, and jumping up and down. And, and, and kind of oddly, it says, some of them, you don't even know why they're there. Uh, and that is so true, isn't it, of so many disturbances and riots and things. People show up, and they don't even know why they're there. They just kind of got drug along with the crowd. Uh, and sometimes that's even their defense when they get arrested. Well, I didn't know. I just got swept up. Uh, in the crowd. But there they are uh, doing all this disturbance. And uh, Alexander, who is a Jew, the Jews kind of push him to the forefront. And there is kind of a stage down there on the on, at the front, of course, of the theater. The theater goes up and the stage is down at the bottom. And uh, uh, he is to, to address the crowd. And, and it's not very clear whether the Jews wanted him to make sure to disassociate them from the Christians or whether he was a Christian Jew and yet they still were asking him to say, you know, tell them that, that, that this isn't about the Jews, this is about the Christians. Now, we wouldn't make that mistake today. The Jewish uh, faith and the Christian church are, are very distinct today, of course, but in that day, they weren't. Uh, the Christians were still seen as a part of, of the, the, the Jewish temple, of the Jewish faith. Uh, Paul was seen as a Messianic Jew. Uh, and he was often referred to as a Jew even before he was referred to as a Christian. And, but Alexander is not able to speak because they realize he's a Jew and for two hours they're screaming, great is Artemis uh, of the Ephesians. And uh, they probably, uh, are again, are confusing him. Uh, he's a Jew. That must mean that he's a Christian. That must mean he's one of these people that is threatening us. And so they continue this disturbance. Well, now the city clerk gets up and the city clerk makes them all be quiet he had enough influence to make everybody be quiet and he addresses them and he says to them that they shouldn't be uh, having this disturbance uh, he is afraid and rightfully so that if ephesus is seen as a place that has all these riots uh the romans may send in the army uh, to deal with them and uh, in ad 70 that's exactly what happened in Israel, and that's when the Romans destroyed the temple and, and drove 
uh, most of the Jews out of Israel, the, one of the great diasporas, and uh, that happens if a people or a country are seen as troublemakers. And one of the ways you can be troublemakers is by having riots. And so he is afraid that you're going to accomplish the very thing that you are afraid of. You're going to lose everything if you keep this riot up. And, and there's a couple of things that he says uh, that are, are true and a couple of things that aren't. One of the things he says to them is, you know, the Christians aren't the ones rioting. This is the true part. They're, they're not uh, just desecrating the temple. Uh, you know, they haven't vandalized the temple. Uh, they haven't done anything wrong. They didn't start a riot. You started the riot. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, they didn't rob you. There's nothing going on that they have done that is, is, is wrong. You're the ones doing wrong. And then he kind of says, and, and you're not even paying attention to good reason, and here's where he gets wrong. He says, isn't it true that the great statue of uh, Diana or of Artemis that is in the temple, it just fell from heaven? fully formed. And so we know that our religion is true and we know that Artemis uh, cares for us and protects us. And so why should we be worried about these Jews who are talking about this dead guy who was raised again uh, from the dead? That doesn't make any sense uh, to us. Uh, uh, Artemis is the one who makes sense to us. Uh, and apparently uh, he uh, uh, a whole sway over the crowd. He dismisses the crowd and that's the end of the riot. And then there is, by the way, I should have mentioned in the middle, a kind of a funny piece, I think, where Paul just wants so badly to go in there and address them. I'll talk to them. I'll speak to them. I'll explain it all. And, and his friends and even some of the ones who just are people that want the riot to be quelled are like, no, 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 you, you just need to stay out. Um, and at the end of this, Paul actually does end up continuing his journey. He does not stay in Ephesus. This is the, the occasion of his departing um, from Ephesus. Well, let's think a little bit uh, about what this means for us and for us on mission. Uh, and as I already mentioned, the clerk was both right and, and wrong. Um, he was right, and he understood that Christians don't engage in violence. We don't engage in coercion. We don't force other people into our way the way that the Romans would and the way that Romans tried to do to, to Christians, as we talked about a, a week or so ago. Uh, instead, we're followers of Jesus. And we recognize that Jesus is a higher power, but also a very different power. And Jesus turns the world upside down in ways that are not the ways that, that people who exercise the more ordinary uh, or more obvious even ways of power do. Jesus doesn't come into political power when he has the opportunity. Jesus doesn't raise an army or call down legions of angels from heaven uh, to defend him when he has uh, the opportunity. He doesn't use uh, political or, or, or violent power. Instead, Jesus uses the power of love. Uh, that's a power that, that takes a very long-term view. Uh, it's a power that is very patient, but it, ultimately it is the only true power in the world. And, uh, and that was where uh, the clerk was wrong. Um, but uh, So we are called to be, as Christians, those who follow Jesus. And that means that although we may engage in some of the the, the powers of the world. And we see Christians in the New Testament do as well. Uh, people who have some political power and, and can perhaps uh, do some good with that political power. Or people who have economic power and can do good uh, with the economic power. Perhaps people who are uh, wonderful people who have religious power in terms of they're particularly close uh, to Christ and they have been re uh, things are revealed to them perhaps that they can share with others and they're able to do that. All of that is fine, but ultimately all of us have the power of love and we need to use that and anytime we use another power in ways that would coerce or violently force people uh, to try to be Christian and the church has done that from time to time baptizing people at the point of a sword and this kind of thing uh, we have completely left uh, the Christian faith uh, we really aren't even followers of, tri of Christ as well uh, in our own world today uh, no one uh, that I know of is being forced to get baptized at the point of a sword uh, but sometimes in our culture, people say, well, I'm engaging in the culture wars, and it's my job to go to war and beat back all those godless people and, 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 and force them into subjection, and, and we'll force them to do whatever we want them to do. That isn't the way of Christ. The way of Christ is never going to war, uh, never using violence and coercion. And the clerk was right all the way back there in Ephesus to say, that's not what these people are about. Uh, and, and he says to the silversmiths, if they have wronged you in some way, if, if they have taken away your income, then you can uh, uh, file a, a report in court. You can file charges against them in court. But you can't use violence to coerce them. And they have clearly shown that they are not using violence to coerce you. Uh, we need to be very careful 
that any time we might have a political or uh, economic or perhaps to a lesser degree religious power that we don't use it to subject other people but rather we use it to make sure that we're defending them even when we disagree with them. Uh, one of the geniuses of our uh, Constitution is uh, that it does not say that the majority, it does say of course the majority rules, but the majority's job in ruling is to make a place for the minority, not to try to push the minority out or to stamp the minority out, uh, but to make room for a minority. They have uh, the right to free speech, they have the right to, to worship, they have the right to assembly, all the, the, those rights, are regardless of whether you're in the majority or the minority, uh, you get those rights and we wanted to protect those because because we trust, as that clerk incorrectly did, uh, that our way ultimately will win out. The way of love, the way of peace, the way of Christ ultimately is the power uh, that will transform the entire world. And those other powers can, can make some short-term goals for sure and, and short-term gains. But long-term, violence only begets violence. Hatred only begets hatred. Uh, oppression just creates other oppression. Uh, it is love that frees. It is forgiveness that sets uh, the, the chains uh, loose. It is Jesus Christ and his incredible power that makes him our Lord and our King, but not in the way of a political Lord or a political King. And one of the tests that we can do when we are thinking about who we're going to vote for, when we're thinking about how we're to exercise power, when we're thinking about what positions we have on, on a particular issue or not, is to use the golden rule. What if I was on the other side of this? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that, of course, is uh, right from the lips of Jesus. And if we are treating others the way that we would want to be treated, we can trust that we are working in the way of Christ. If we're treating others in the ways that we would not want to be treated, then we aren't following the way of Christ. Well, the cleric I mentioned was wrong in that uh, uh, Diana or Artemis was uh, would win in the end uh, by the 320s when her or the excuse me the 250s not the 350s uh, by the time that the uh, temple to uh, uh, Diana was destroyed the cult of Diana was also waning uh, Christianity was growing and it was beginning to, to to push out not by violence or coercion but by the truth of what it was was pushing the other religions out and of course uh, as far as I know there are nobody there's nobody left on earth who worships uh, Artemis or Diana but the church is still here with us and so to end our, our mission our, our quarter uh, that focused on missions uh, let's uh, recommit ourselves uh, to Jesus Christ and to his way let's remember that God's family is open to all and anybody that I might hate is somebody that God doesn't hate. It's someone that God loves. I may hate their behavior. I may not agree with their positions or their religion or whatever, uh, but God loves them dearly. God created them, and at some level, they are created in the image of God. Whether I can see it or not, it's there, and that was the genius of Jesus. He could see right through all of that other stuff, man, woman, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, whatever it was, uh, and he could see uh, beyond, behind all of that that each person is created in the image of God. And Jesus opened his family to the entire world, to everyone, and we're on missions. Uh, we do that as well. Uh, we don't engage in tribalism, uh, but rather we recognize that our arms, our doors are open to all. And we invite all to see Jesus as our Lord and our King just as we do. And we follow him even when it is the way that might lead us into trouble as we see in the story of Paul. Uh, we do it anyway. Even when it may mean that it's going to cost me uh, maybe tremendously in the present, I trust that in the long term, if I am doing the way of Jesus, I am making ripples that will ripple out all the way out into eternity. We have the long view of eternity and we have the present reality of the love and the peace of Christ. And if we are looking at those things and experiencing those things and seeking those things, we can be sure that our mission will be a mission that Christ will approve of and that Christ will strengthen. And I'm thankful for that, and I'm sure you are as well. Amen.